You know our next guest very well. She's had a diverse and successful four-decade career as a television host, actress, singer, songwriter, playwright, and author. But what you may not know is that she's been working tirelessly for the past 12 years to see her new Broadway musical become a reality. Here to tell us about Scandalous, the life and trials of Amy Semple McPherson, is none other than the delightful Kathy Lee Gifford. Kathy Lee, welcome to the show. Thank you so much for having me. Kathy Lee, you've been working to make Scandalous a reality for 12 years now. In fact, it's become something of a life's mission for you. What's the story behind Scandalous? It has been a 12-year journey now for me since the first songs were written for the story of Amy Semple McPherson. It's had many names during that journey, depending on which story about Amy we were trying to tell. And I've probably written in the last 12 years, I would say, 10 full musicals about her depending on which story I wanted to tell about her. Was it Amy the preacher, Amy the feminist, Amy the visionary, Amy the genius, Amy the mother, Amy the tabloid queen, Amy the woman who changed the face of America in the 1920s? I mean, this woman lived so many different lifetimes during her 54 years. That's been the process of trying to sculpt it down to what story now do we want to tell about Amy Semple McPherson to a secular audience on a Broadway stage. So that's why it's taken so long. And what's been your personal involvement in bringing Amy's story to Broadway? I first heard about Amy when I was in college over 40 years ago, and I remember thinking nobody could have lived a life like that. And then later, when I moved to Los Angeles in the mid-1970s to pursue my own career, because her temple had been there and she'd done most of her great work in Los Angeles, I started hearing all kinds of stories about her, some mythological, others true. It was hard to decipher which ones were true and which weren't. She was so legendary in Los Angeles and still is. But ultimately, I went to a church out there where my pastor had gone to a Bible church that she had founded, and then I dated for a very short time the grandson of her third husband. Yes, she was married three times, divorced twice. Then when I was dating Frank Gifford, In the mid-1980s, I was telling him about this fascination I had with her, and Frank said to me, oh, I went to her church as a kid. I remember her really well. He was 12 years old in 1944 when he and his family, a Pentecostal family, went to Amy's church at Echo Park in uh, Los Angeles. So now it was getting weird. Every time I turned around, there was some sort of connection. Ultimately, when I was serious about writing this story, I called her daughter, Amy's daughter, who was still alive, and she was 86 at the time and lived in New York where I was living, and I went to visit her many, many times, and she particularly said, you're going to write Mother's Story, and then her son, who also was in his 80s, told me the same thing. They've all tried to tell my mother's story, but you're the one that's going to, and I took that as a tremendous responsibility. I wanted to be fair to this incredible woman. I didn't think I could tell her story without telling it warts and all because it's not a good story unless you understand how weak the woman was, which, you know, makes her story all the stronger. Then it turns out that Amy's daughter, Roberta, had actually rebelled against her mother's faith years ago, married a Jewish violinist, and ultimately that Jewish violinist was a man named Harry Salter who created Name That Tune, which I got my big start on in Hollywood in 1977, and I never ever made the connection. So now it was like Twilight Zone time. Do, 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 do. <laughs> and from then I just kept writing, you know, kept forging ahead. I kept trying to get the right cast, the right, get the money, get the, get the theater, get people excited, do the press, write it, write it, write it, rewrite it over a thousand times. You just do what it takes. And that's what I've done. And what's your hope for Scandalous? Oh, gosh, my hope for Scandalous has always been that I would just be faithful to it, that I would not give up. I think it's the people in life that actually make it to Broadway, that actually do see their dreams come true, that actually do accomplish their bucket list in life, are the ones that don't give up. Fear can be such a paralyzing thing in people's lives, and I'm not afraid of the critics hating it. I'm not afraid of people not coming to see it. I was more afraid of not finishing it, not doing the work. It's the most important thing is to do the work involved, we live in a, in a society today that doesn't want to do the work. We just want all the advantages of it. We just want to show up and have it all turn out okay. But this doesn't work that way. You've got to do the work. And actually, the joy of the accomplishment is in the work itself. 
and, and I've loved the work and the people that I've met in the process. And getting to that place now where we open, we're opening on Broadway at the Neil Simon Theater on West 52nd Street against all odds. And it's, it's thrilling on the one hand. It's completely and totally exhausting on the other. I haven't had more than two hours of sleep a night in the last six weeks. But it's amazing how you just keep going and going and going because of the passion you have for something. So that's all I can hope for is that I, is that I finish the work of the gun. Now you have some partners as well. Who's helping make Scandalous a reality? Oh my gosh, so many people are helping. My two composer friends, David Pomerantz and David Friedman, have just been faithful since day one. They are brilliant, brilliant men. And I'm so, my daddy used to say, find people you're smarter than you are and more talented and you'll look good. And that's the case with my two Davids. And then my cast, uh, Carolee Carmelo, George Hearn, Roz Ryan. We have an amazing all-star Broadway cast of Tony-nominated, Tony-winning people. They're just extraordinary. The people who invest in your show. I mean, it takes millions of dollars to bring a, a show, especially a brand-new show that's not branded. We're not Spider-Man. We're not Adam's Family. We're not Ghost. We're not, we're not something that the general public has a familiarity with. So it's that much harder to bring a show to Broadway that people just don't know what the show is. So I'm incredibly grateful to our investors who believed in it from day one and said, no, we, we know this is a gamble, we know this is a crapshoot, but we believe in this, and, and we think it's got a powerful message, and we're going to be there with you all to the very end. So, you know, and these days, you know, somebody's willing to invest millions of dollars into something that you're, you're trying to create. It's huge. I'm deeply, deeply grateful to them. So... It's everybody along the way, your directors, your, your, your wardrobe designers, your set designers, your the woman who just designed, which just won the Tony this past year for once on Broadway, is our, is our lighting director. And it's just, I, I sit in the dark and I look over at this woman working at the lighting board and I go, she just won the Tony last year and now she's working on our show. And it's just, it's overwhelming. I'm so grateful. I am the most blessed woman on the planet. What an amazing story. We can't wait to see it ourselves. Kathy Lee, thanks for joining us. Oh, thank you so much, and please come see Scandalous. It's a heck of a story about a hell of a woman. To learn more about Scandalous and for tickets and showtimes, visit www.scandalousonbroadway.com.